So yeah, so I'm Richard Pinches. I am known as the Lone Rat, and as Anne quite rightly said, I do this uh, in memory of my father. I'm just going to set my timer on the phone because um, the three-hour talk I've got, I don't want to run over into four hours. <laughs> right, just let me start my timer. Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, Ellen Back. Uh, as Anne quite rightly said, I'm an Eighth Army enthusiast and living historian. Uh, I can show you later in the show, um, in the slideshow, what a living historian actually is. But this is to uh, this is my slide talk on my 80th anniversary battlefield tour of the Battle of El Alamein. So who was there? So you recognise these guys: uh, Montgomery, obviously, and Erwin Rommel. These are the two people that were combating against each other at the Battle of El Alamein. So where was the, the Battle of El Alamein? It was simply at this train stop. Has anybody been to El Alamein? Fantastic, well done, John. So, it's, so it literally, the only thing there is a little train stop. This is the coast road that runs from Alexandria to Mercer Matru, and that train, is, that train track is still there. So the reason why the battle was chosen to be fought here was because of this. So it is a very defensible line. The desert is a huge span, expanse of nothingness, desert, sand, rock. In this little area here, between the Mediterranean Sea and the Qatar Depression, uh, there is a 40 mile gap. And that is, so El Alamein is literally just there. Uh, the Qatar Depression, for those who don't know, is uh, a boggy marsh. It's impassable for heavy armour. Um, unless you're driving a K2 ambulance driven by John Mills, you cannot get through the Qatar <laughs> Depression. So, why North Africa? Okay, so just to briefly summarise why we're in North Africa at all. Uh, Benito Mussolini was defeated in January 1941 by General Wavell, and he was pushed all the way back to, tri to near Tripoli to El Agila. Um, Hitler sent his best, his best general, Erwin Rommel, to, to uh, pick up the fight and help the fascist, uh, his fascist ally. Hitler also wanted to have control of the Suez Canal um, to aid sea navigation but also he wanted to try and get to the Middle East and the oil reserves there. Now, lastly, the Sixth Army was also expected to succeed in Operation Barbarossa. So yeah, Operation Barbarossa was happening here. So Hitler was hoping to join forces with uh, the Africa Corps fighting West and the Japanese obviously fighting in the East, fighting West. The idea was that all the Axis meet together for total world domination. Luckily, that didn't happen. So, just stepping back a little bit, what made me interested in the desert conflict? Well, these are my original uh, Airfix 132nd scale 8th Army uh, models. <coughs> Badly hand painted by myself. Uh, I had great fun with my, with my friends playing war with these. But it wasn't only my interest in modelling. It was basically my father, which Anne also referenced earlier. Peter Pinches, uh, nicknamed Ginger, uh, because of the hair obviously. Uh, born in 1920, died in 2015, he was a driver in the Royal Army Service Corps. So this is a bit of audience participation. Does anybody know the, the other explanations for RASC in the, in the group? So it's run away, someone's coming. <laughs> have, have, have you heard that one? And the other one is Rommel's Auxiliary Supply Company. Because there were occasions when we were running away and literally all the supplies were left behind and Rommel benefited from uh, uh, those lovely lorries left behind. This is actually the type of lorry my father would have driven. It's a QL Bedford. Um, there's no pictures of my father's actual lorry, but this is exactly the type of lorry that he would have driven. Uh, he was first line of communication, so he was driving troops, ammunition and supplies to the front line. Right, where are we now? So, the battle in the Western Desert was known as an honourable war. Both armies were fighting in foreign lands far away from their own home. The flat, featureless, desolate terrain was perfect for army tacticians. And there was no fighting in towns and there was no civilians. It was literally empty, desolate, nothing, nothingness. And you will see slides of that empty desolation later on. So this is actually um, the front cover of a book called El Alamein. Um, and the subtitle is War Without Hate. This is a real photograph of two soldiers they've just actually had a bayonet fight with each other. If you can see, they've both got wounded uh, um, left arms because they've been fighting each other with their right-handed bayonets. The German here is actually now captured, so he's a prisoner, and he's sharing a cigarette. This is a genuine photograph. 
he's sharing a cigarette with his, uh, with his captor there. So, total compassion, obviously he gave up, pointless, poking somebody with your bayonet. The bayonet is obviously a 17 inches steel, 1907 uh, pattern bayonet there. It gives you a long reach on a rifle, let me tell you that. So, the Desert War was a very complicated campaign. I've made a slideshow, I've made a graphic to explain the movements across the desert. Um, <laughs> it's a seesaw, and literally the movement across the desert, across the three years, was a seesaw. But it's slightly better explained as an elastic band. So what happens is, um, advancing armies suffer from supply issues. So the further an army advances, the harder it is to get supplies there. So the more the elastic band is stretched, it tends to, tends to pull back. So it's very hard to keep your front line supplied. This is, why, um, this is why the movement across the desert was so uh, back and forth. So first of all, uh, the Italians attacked in uh, 1940 and they crossed the, uh, the, this is the wire, this is Libya, this is Egypt. They crossed the, the, uh, the, the border and General Wavell pushed them back. So in, in December 1940, Operation Compass started and General Wavell, with only 30,000 soldiers of the Western Desert Force, managed to push the Italian army all the way back to El Agila. Now, uh, Operation Compass, big success, and in the end of Cop Operation Compass, we had captured 130,000 prisoners and thousands of tons of supplies. So what happened then was uh, General Wavell lost most of his force to go and defend Greece and Crete, um, which left us vulnerable because by this point, in March 1941, uh, Hitler sent over his best favoured general, Erwin Rommel, he was victor in, North, in North, North, Northern France. Rommel started the Africa Corps. Now Rommel landed uh, in early March 1941, and within two weeks, Rommel had launched a massive offensive. The British were not expecting this, they're expecting things to take a long time. British Army is ponderous, uh, Rommel is not. Rommel was known to be decisive and striking while the iron was hot. He actually had a quick success, mainly because we weren't expecting it, and mainly because Wavell's forces were depleted. So uh, Rommel, uh, oh, sorry, I need to go from a pointer, not the thing. So Rommel pushed us back to here. Um, but Tobruk held out. Famously, the siege of Tobruk uh, held out for 282 days. It's a deep sea port and the 9th Australian Division were mainly defending it and they were supplied by the sea because it was a deep sea port and they were able to be supplied uh, by the sea and they held out. It was a thorn in Rommel's side and it is generally taken that it is the, 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 the siege of Tobruk where the desert rats got their name. Now Lord Hawhaw, most of you have heard of, he was a propagandist, he had a radio show, Germany calling, Germany calling. He described the defenders of Tobruk uh, as dug in like rats. And that is kind of where the desert rat uh, names come from. My little nocturnal friend here, Jeremy the Jaboa. So, uh, where were we? Rommel has pushed forward to Brooks Held. We tried, well, General Wavell tried twice to relieve to Brook with Operation Brevity and Operation Battle Axe. Uh, both failed and um, Wavell was actually sacked. So General Auchinleck was now appointed uh, head of the 8th Army and he managed to launch Operation Crusader which actually relieved Tobruk. And not only did it relieve Tobruk, but we were able to push uh, Rommel all the way back to El Agila again. You see where the seesaw action comes and the elastic band comes. Um, again, a bit of stalemate. Rommel regrouped over a period of time and his big push was, was Jan 1942. And we had a defensive line called the Gazala Gap here. Um, and we thought it was impregnable. But what did Rommel do? Uh, Rommel went round the southern tip and outflanked us from behind. He's not stupid. So, um, the Gazala Gallop. Gazala Gap. Rommel acted very quickly, uh, exploiting the uh, advantage. And he started to push all the way back into, into Egypt. Now, Orkenlek was the one that discovered, or rather envisaged, that the defensive line of El Alamein was the place to hold out. He'd already mapped it out, people were already digging in. So that was their uh, last, that's literally their last stand. Rommel was so quick across here that the uh, HQ in Alexandria, the uh, Allied forces were just burning all the documentation. 
It's a day known as Ash Wednesday, when basically all the important paperwork was being burnt. They expected Alexandria to be taken within a week. That didn't happen. There was a first battle of Alamein, roughly just here, in July 1942, but it was a bit of a stalemate. If you can imagine, Rommel's forces have come all the way from over here. They're tired, they're depleted, they were not in a fighting condition. So the first battle of Alamein was actually a stalemate. Uh, and then what happened was, um, Winston Churchill thought Auchinleck should attack. Auchinleck said, no way, I am not attacking. So he got sacked. Um, so, um, so Winston Churchill then put a man, a general, called William Strafer Gott in charge. Now you haven't heard of Gott, sadly, or you may not have heard of William Gott, because sadly he died. He was a desert veteran, he'd been in campaign since 1939, he knew his stuff, he was the man to take charge of the 8th Army. Tragically, he was taken off from Fuca Airport when his plane was shot down and he died. Now, we think that that was uh, because of German intelligence. So, in Alexandria, the, the American ambassador, uh, Bonifellas, he had an office and he was sending dispatches to Washington Although they weren't officially in, 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 the, in the North Africa campaign yet, he was sending dispatches to Washington about activity in North Africa. What Bonifellas didn't know was that two Italian spies had crept into his office, copied his code book, replaced it, and snuck back out again. So every communication Bonifellas sent to Washington, Rommel had. And we think that probably is what uh, sealed uh, William Gott's fate. And he sadly, he, he died in an in a, in a aircraft uh, he got shot down. So that now brings in Montgomery. Montgomery was now elected the uh, commander of the 8th Army. He had been in, in Palestine, but the troops in, uh, in Egypt had not known him. To him, they, he was a strange man, white knees. Um, they had no, they just, they, at first they didn't like him, but he was very good. The 8th Army were completely demoralized. They were poorly supplied. Uh, they thought Rommel was unbeatable. What Montgomery did was completely turn it around. He retrained them, he resupplied them, he gave them good morale. He went round all the troops, he spoke to them in person. The other generals were a bit sort of officious, they didn't actually meet the, meet the troops very much. Montgomery was, was a soldier's person, a soldier's general. He turned it round, as we all know. Right, how are we doing for time? Perfect. Uh, my, my stopwatch has seemed to have stopped. Okay, so. Uh, 13 minutes into my three hour talk. Fantastic, okay. Um, we're gonna crack on. So that's roughly the seesaw action in North Africa in 1942 uh, to 1940 to 43. So the actual battle itself started on the 23rd of October at 2140 uh, hours. This was known as Operation Lightfoot. This Montgomery, I should just say reprise, Montgomery also refused to attack. Did I mention that? So he also refused to attack until he had twice as many as Rommel had of everything. Troops, tanks, guns, everything. It's easy to defend, but if you attack, you need twice the value of your enemy's forces. So Montgomery was persuaded, well, Hitler, Winston Churchill, I do get them confused. Winston Churchill, <laughs> it's a bit of a bad thing, isn't it, really? The baddies and the goodies. Um, so Churchill was desperate for an attack, he begged Montgomery to attack. There's pictures, Churchill visited Montgomery in the desert. There's pictures of Churchill wearing his pith helmet and his siren suit. My father saw him over there, said, funny little man. He was over there to try and coerce Montgomery to attack. Montgomery, same as Auchinleck, said, I'm not ready to attack. I'm not going to do it. Rommel, Rommel's a good guy. I'm not going to attempt this until I'm confident of winning. So it wasn't until the 23rd of October, 1942, where um, Montgomery decided to uh, launch the attack. Now, uh, the code book issue with Bonifellas had been resolved, so we'd, we'd sorted out the, the, the security leak from uh, Alexandria, but we also, we had our own intelligence from Bletchley Park. Operation Ultra told Montgomery that Rommel was not in the Western Desert. He had jaundice of the liver, so uh, Rommel was at home with the wife and kid, uh, and he wasn't there. So, uh, excellent opportunity to attack. Uh, the evening of the 23rd, Operation Lightfoot started. A barrage of 500 guns pom pommeled Rommel's line. Uh, 
for over five hours. Half a million shells were uh, used up in that attack. That was one of the biggest barrages of, of all time. Now, why is it called Operation Lightfoot? Well, um, literally, the enemy lines are protected by two miles of mines. Uh, known as Devil's Garden, uh, the first attack of the infantry was basically more of uh, uh, the sappers, Remy. The sappers were going forward. They were trying to clear paths through behind them for the armour to come through. So Operation Lightfoot is named because um, anti-tank mine, you can walk on an anti-tank mine, just about, it won't blow up. And most of the minefields were anti-tank, but there were a few of these nasty things here. This is a spring mine. Uh, anybody know what the uh, nickname for a spring mine is? Nope. Bouncing something. Bouncing Betty. I thought somebody might have known that. It's a Bouncing Betty. It's a rather nasty device. It's, under, it's underground. There's trip wires coming out from the uh, uh, top bits here. After you trip it, it's, it leaps up from the ground, leaving its um, outer case in the ground, leaps up from the ground, it explodes uh, 360 people bearings laterally. And it's not a, not a nice thing, but it's not designed to kill, it's designed to maim. Now, why does it maim? Why do they want it to maim? Quite simply, dead men uh, don't need medicine, food, water or transport. So the more men they can injure, they know that the Allies will have a, a more uh, a, an attrition looking after those poor injured sods. So, Operation Lightfoot because of the minefield. So this is an Imperial War Museum image of the Australian infantry advancing through um, the battlefield itself. It's actually a complete fake photograph. You may have seen it in popular press. It's actually a posed press photograph by the Army Film and Photographic Unit, led by Sergeant Len Chetwin. Um, it's very well composed, it's an iconic image. It was in the Illustrated Press, it was published all over the world as part of the publicity for uh, the successful breakout of Eleanor Main, but it's posed. Um, it's posed and it's a very nice shot. Um, the poor sods that were actually in the front line would not have had the chance to take such an interesting uh, composed <laughs> and staged photograph. They were keeping their heads down. Len Chetwin, he had the luxury of composing this theatrically uh, behind the lines uh, with no pressure of time and no fear of death. Um, so this is a real photograph of tanks advancing across the, uh, the Egyptian desert. But also I will reference, this is, this is a poor tank crew. This is, uh, I believe, a Stuart tank, which my dad always nicknamed a honeypot. Look at the tank crew. What are they wearing? They are wearing um, winter stuff. Why are they wearing winter stuff? Well, they're in the desert. The desert is baking hot during the day, but it is freezing at night. So they're probably just having their first brew up in the morning. Um, they've got a Benghazi cooker here. So this is a, a, a flimsy tin that's cutting half. And the way of brewing tea is literally you pour sand into half your tin and you pour petrol in it and you set light to it and it makes a very, very efficient uh, uh, heat source and, it, and it's easy to brew up. Um, coincidentally, brewing up is also what happens to tanks. These were nicknamed Tommy Cookers or Ronsils because if a, uh, if a shell hit at a tank, the percussive energy of the shell hitting the tank would tragically, literally raise the temperature inside the tank to such, a volume, to such a temperature that the, uh, they, they, they cook and burn. It's horrible. My dad always said to tank crews, uh, I wouldn't be in your tank for love nor money. And they would say to him, I wouldn't be in your soft skin lorry either. I fancy my chances more in my tank, matey, than your lorry. Right, time-wise, what are we doing? We're doing, we're doing. So, um, any questions so far? So, um, Oh, sorry, yes. Um, cheaper in this in terms of supplies. Yeah, so going back, if I just go back, great question. Uh, go back to um, here. Now, we were able to resupply Brook to Brook only because we still held, held, held Malta. Malta, as you all know, was a small island. It had RAF forces based there, and our RAF forces were bombing the hell out of German uh, shipping. The success of, uh, of this whole campaign 
we, we did hinge on Malta basically, I mean we'll say Gibraltar as well, but Malta was in striking distance of Sicily, so the Luftwaffe were, were bombing Malta from Sicily uh, and it was atrocious, it, it was an atrocious thing for the, the uh, residents of Malta suffered really badly because they were holding out. Um, and because they did, the RAF was still flying from Malta and still attacking the German shipping. They were sinking supplies quite regularly. Uh, actually, at the Battle of El Alamein, well, at the first Battle of El Alamein, I referenced in July, the reason why Rommel was stuck was because one of his major oil tankers had just been sunk. So because of the success of Malta, uh, Rommel basically ran out of fuel. So yes, Malta was very important. Uh, I'd love to go to Malta, it's on my list. So uh, here we are, uh, cold in the desert. Right, so I'll show you the map in a second, but the infantry attack in the northern sector comprised of Australian, New Zealand, Highland and South African divisions. All separate sectors trying to make clear paths for anti-tank guns and armour to come through the minefields. They made slow progress and uh, they, they were actually delaying the action because the mines weren't cleared in time. So here we go. This is El Alamein, this is the train stop. This is the Qatar depression. This is the 40 mile uh, um, uh, line, El Alamein line. Roughly you've got five miles distance between the uh, two facing armies with at least two, mine, two miles of minefields on each side. Obviously, you can walk through your own minefields because you know where they are, but the Germans had to be cleared. So down here, uh, we've got British forces. Up here, we've got New Zealand, uh, Highland, Australian, and South African. And those were the first combatants to break through the line in the north. Now, interestingly enough, we had done a big deception here. Operation Bertram actually built a whole army down here, an army of fake tanks. Uh, you might have seen the pictures, uh, inflatable tanks, um, tanks covered, no, it was just cardboard, cardboard cutouts of canvas, wood, fake tanks. We actually had uh, radio crews sending fake radio signals as well. And what Monty had done, what we had done, we had built, we started to build a pipeline. The pipeline was only built out of uh, old oil drums, but deliberately the pipeline was uh, unfinished. So to make it believe that we weren't ready for attack. The feint worked very well. The 21st Panzer Division are down here. That's one of Hitler's finest armour divisions. Um, he thought the attack would come down here, uh, but we successfully uh, convinced them, we successfully fooled them and attacked in the north. So here we go. This is a, this is a, a infantry taking uh, a tank. Uh, guess what? It's another fake photograph. <laughs> This chap here is, is their chum. Uh, he's just dressed up with a captured tank. Um, again, uh, chances of a photographer being there and taking that for real is very minimal. So uh, never trust photographers. They're, they're lying, deceitful gits. <laughs> so this is Rommel's personal map of the Alamein line. Uh, you, you, you can't really read it, but he's actually got down here most of our own divisions here. Right, okay, so the original northern attack stalled and was followed by an, al an allied attack in the south. Copying uh, Rommel's uh, like one-two type um, uh, punch. If you're a boxer, you go left and right. We copied his tactics with some success. Operation Surcharge was the final success that came from the allied attack in the middle of the line. Uh, by the 3rd of October, by the 3rd of November, we'd broken through. Hitler sent Rommel an order to fight to the death. He said the German army has faced worse adversaries in the past. He expects every soldier to stand and fight to the death. Rommel didn't want to sacrifice his lovely Africa Corps. He chose a tactical retreat. He left that, the tactical retreat meant leaving the Italians behind. Uh, uh, he took all the, all the, all the uh, lorries, all the me mechanism he needed to escape, and he ran away, leaving the Italians to, to do a, a rear guard, uh, which didn't last very long. The battle lasted 12 days, which is exactly what uh, Monty predicted. Right, I need to hurry up here slightly, I think. So, roughly, um, the forces involved were, oh, go back. Uh, so, roughly, um, we had, we were fighting 195,000 Allied forces against 16, 116,000 Axis forces, half of which were Italian. If you look at the list here, roughly, I'll summarise briefly, we had twice of everything of the enemy. Right, now, you know this guy, 
Um, before Alamein, <laughs> yeah, at Winston. Before Alamein, we never had a victory. After Alamein, we never had a defeat. He also said, quite famously, now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. And he's quite right, after that, we pushed through and the Germans were defeated. So, this picture of, I just referenced this photograph of Churchill. He's got a very sour look on his face. Why do you think that is? He's got a sour look because the photographer was Josef Karsch and he'd just taken the cigar out of Winston's mouth because <laughs> he didn't want the cigar in the photograph. And that produced this horrible glower which has become an icon of Churchill. So, briefly going back to uh, Alan Main itself, this is the truck stop, sorry, train stop in 1942. I visited in 2017, and this is it in slight shambles. I'll reference it shortly, it gets worse. This is Steve Hamilton. He is uh, a World War II walking encyclopedia. He runs Western Desert Battlefield Tours, and I thoroughly recommend his tours. And I was booked to go on the 80th tour, as referenced earlier. But two weeks before we departed, he phoned me up and said, Richard, can you see where I am? It was a WhatsApp call on a phone. It just looked like a face. No. He said, uh, I'm in hospital. Uh, I've had a heart attack. Uh, I can't go on the trip. I said, what? Uh, can you take the tour for me, please? I said, OK. Um, I'll try. So. I hit some research. Uh, <laughs> I, had a, I, had, I had a good reference already of the, of, the, of the battle, but I had to do some more in-detail uh, research, and I did that. So, on arrival to Cairo, I had a little problem. In this package here uh, is something that customs confiscated from me. Any guesses what it is? Drugs, booze, ammunition? No, it is uh, my drone. Uh, I had a drone in my luggage, and Egyptian, uh, sorry, Cairo Customs said, nope, can't bring that in here. So uh, they held me under police guard for four hours. Um, none of them spoke English. They found one guy that spoke English. They asked me what my name was, where I was from, why I was here, where I was staying. And they eventually let me go. Uh, but my drone was uh, held hostage. Uh, I did recover it when I left, uh, but they just they don't like drones. So, um, my crew, I flew with 11 people from UK. Um, the crew I flew with, sorry, the, uh, the, 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 the members of the tour, I'd left to go to the hotel. I was left behind. I didn't catch up with them until the next day. This is the next day. Um, this is all 21 of us. So these are my tour group for the 80th anniversary. They are from New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Croatia, England, and America. Lots of the members here had uh, members of the family that fought and in some cases died in the Battle of El Alamein. So quite a lot of responsibility. Um, we spent time uh, discussing war stories, we shared stories, very convivial, we all got on like a house on fire. I'll consider most of those still my friends. So when you're in Cairo, uh, you might expect to see pyramids, uh, horses, cityscape, but in Cairo what you actually get these days is this. Cairo is absolutely disgusting. Uh, and this is just outside Cairo. This is basically rubbish everywhere. It's so sad to see the Egyptians don't care. They throw rubbish out windows. Uh, they pile it up by the side of the roads. Right. Briefly going back to the actual train stop itself. This is again 42. This is 2017. Uh, and when I visited in October last year, it now looks like this. They have a uh, the roof is in a greater uh, state of disarray and they've bricked up the, the, the main part, which is quite good because before people were using it as a human toilet. It is, it is disgusting and it's so sad to see. This is the back end of it. This fire here was literally, oh, sorry, this was literally burning, uh, rubbish everywhere. Uh, it was tragic. The Egyptians don't relish, they don't realise it's a, it's a relic that could earn them money for tourism. Um, so, first day of, first day of the uh, tour, I did a little talk. This is me talking to the uh, lovely tour, uh, my tour members. We visited the El Alamein uh, Museum, uh, where the Egyptians have actually recovered some of the armour and painted it a lovely, funny colour of sand. But what they've also done is here, they've cobbled together uh, a Bren carrier 
and a Stuart turret, and they've, in some horrible chimera, they've put the turret on a Bren gun, and you can't read it here, but it just says British tank. <laughs> they don't care, do they? Uh, behind is a Crusader, which is obviously one of the main tanks of the battle. So next, who knows what this is? Well done, John. Top of the class. <laughs> this is the evil 88 anti... It's actually a, a flat gun, but the Germans used it as an anti-armour, and it's devastating. It's got a radio, It's got a, a range of between 10 and 15 miles. Um, it, it was just devastating. Anyway, good to see it in the flesh. So, this is the same day. This is a ceremony uh, on the Commonwealth grave, on the Allied Commonwealth grave, actually, uh, in the cemetery of El Alamein. Uh, there was wreath laying, there was a band playing, uh, not as big as it was five years ago for the 75th, but it's still quite nice to see representations from all over the world laying wreaths. So after the ceremony, we walked around the graveyard. This is my uh, South African friend Francois walking away. There are 7,200 Allied uh, uh, combatants commemorated here. They're not all gravestones, some are obviously missing, and tragically, uh, when you get groups of gravestones like that, that means they can't identify the bodies. So, moving on. This is the German cemetery, which is also uh, in the same area as Alamein. This is not quite so elaborate. It's more of a, a crypt. It's a lot smaller affair. Um, but the Italian cemetery uh, is a cathedral-like. This is a fantastic monument. It's marbled. It's echoes, it's got a very good feel to it. And all the individual soldiers at least get their own little uh, marble box. Good on the Italians. Right, any questions? <laughs> Two and a half hours to go. Yeah. Steve Hamilton Bevan? He is. Thank you for asking. He, um, he's, uh, I'm, I'm, he's doing a Tunisian trip. If anybody wants to go to Tunisia in May, he's doing a Tunisian trip. His grandfather died in Tunisia. He's got, uh, yeah, he's okay. Thank you. So, um, briefly, uh, to try and summarise, this is me on the actual anniversary of the, of the battle. It's called Walking the Ground. So, I took my uniform, I dressed up. Uh, I didn't tell my guests I was dressing up, and walking to the breakfast in the morning, I had some quite funny looks from the hotel staff. But um, I had to do it. It felt really good to be there. This is the terrain in the background. This is the northern sector of the battle, where it started, uh, and here, the coast, so the German cemetery is here and the Italian cemetery is here. These are called hills. These were, these were uh, observation points during the Second World War and they were literally only 25 or 30 metres high. You do not get anything taller than that. They call that a hill because it still gives you a good chance for observing your enemy. Um, so that's where the cemeteries were and the coast is just behind that line there. And the railway line, obviously, is just behind there as well. So this is the railway line. This got Alexandria down the bottom, and Mercer Matru is at the end. There are still relics in the desert. These are biscuit tins, which are there. These are uh, flimsy tins. These sell in UK for hundred pounds a hit. If you're a reenactor or a collector, they're worth hundred pounds a hit. They're quite rare, but obviously we couldn't take them away for the obvious reasons. Um, this is there are still entrenchments here. This is a place called Kaponga Box. This is now at the, at the southern line of the, uh, of the, of the uh, battlefield. And there's actually sandbags still here. They look brand new. You go to touch them and they fall apart. Here I played uh, a little trick on the two twins that were the two nine-year-old twins. This is my pet scorpion. I bought it from Amazon. <laughs> I placed it, I placed it on the ground just near here and screamed, it's a scorpion! And uh, the boys were right next to me. I planned it that way. And they, they, they jumped as well. And even the adults came across it and said, oh my God, it's a scorpion. What should we do? So I, I picked it up and said, uh, nothing. Just put it back in my <laughs> But coincidentally, <laughs> the next day, uh, we actually uh, did see a real scorpion. <laughs> Little blighter. So, and the scorpion, obviously, you might know, is the uh, emblem for the Long Range Desert Group. Scorpion is in their logo. Long Range Desert Group, they're uh, uh, party brigands that were special services uh, working behind enemy lines to uh, gain reconnaissance and blow up petrol dumps and uh, aircraft fields. We were there to commemorate uh, the fallen as well. This is a famous Victoria Cross winner called Adam Wakenshaw. 
He died here um, firing his two pounder gun against a German uh, artillery position. He actually, his whole crew were uh, already killed. He managed to fire the gun five times with a head injury and one arm. It was blown off, one arm was blown off. He won a VC for uh, fighting there. Uh, eventually he was sadly killed, but his actions saved the infantry company behind him and he won uh, his VC there. Many VCs were won, uh, but that was one that I referenced because we actually visited the spot. So my friend uh, Adam was actually Durham Light Infantry and uh, the chap here, my friend, he was um, there on behalf of Durham Light Infantry and he read out the Durham Light Infantry poem and he read the citation. Steve Hamilton had actually been to this spot with Adam Wakenshaw's family earlier that year and they started building the cairn here but as a group we all added another rock to it. So hopefully in a few years time it'll be a massive pile. This is uh, Clive again, this is next to the cairn that we built. Again look at the terrain, look it's horrible, it's horrible. You can't dig into that, it's not sandy, nice stuff, it's horrible, it's rocky, it's, hard. it's horrible. Right, so this is our little troop, we had three minibuses, uh, we had a police escort all the time, but we also had, oh, we had armed guards. The Egyptian government gave us uh, protection, didn't pay for it. These armed guards have got a 9mm Heckler & Koch submachine gun hidden underneath those jackets. And they were with us all the time. Uh, and there's also more armed, armed protection here. Um, the Egyptian government obviously have got few tourists as it is, so they don't want any more tourists to die uh, for bad publicity. Um, that was quite amusing. So, apart from our armed guards that we had with us all the time, we also had Islam on the left. He's our location manager and on the ground fixer. And we had Hamdi, he's our Egyptologist. These were for GAT tours who were looking after us uh, on behalf of Western Desert Tours. And these guys and their knowledge made a really big difference to the tour. Uh, and Islam especially, he's done like nearly 30 tours with Steve, so his knowledge on the ground was invaluable. Uh, and the tour operators are so helpful, we definitely recommend uh, these guys. So, after the battlefield tour, we went back to Cairo. Um, we, uh, I rode a camel. Uh, the owner of the camel makes sure that he does this little trick. He picks up a little rock, he takes your phone, come on your phone, picks your phone, he takes a picture. And the picture's quite effective, but obviously at the end of it, he asked for a bit of uh, buckshist for extra, an extra tip. Uh, crafty old Arabs. So uh, we went into a, into a Great Pyramid. Uh, actually, so that's the Queen's Pyramid. Uh, and this is a, a Nile tour. This is before we got on a Nile cruise ship. Now, we ate out quite a lot. The food's quite meaty. And I have to say that almost without exception, none of us failed to evade Tutankhamun's revenge. <laughs> so. Um, we try to avoid the salad. I say, don't eat the salad. It's washed in water. You don't know where it's been. Uh, but unfortunately, avoid the salad as we did. We still got the trots. So, in Cairo Museum itself, it's a fantastic place, but it's so sad. Um, they have little signs up saying, do not touch the relics. You can see here a, a sarcophagus that's been touched by, oh, roughly 10 million people. And they've actually literally just worn it away. But the best thing in the Cairo Museum, obviously, is Tutankhamun's uh, little side exhibition. The death mask is fantastic to see. It's beautifully detailed. Um, you get close up to it. It's amazing. It's thousands of years old, and it is just incredible. These are obviously the other relics found uh, when Howard Carter discovered the tomb in 1921. Right, we're getting towards the end. Thank you for sticking with it. Uh, guess the film. Anybody guess what the film's going to be? Oh, well done, John. You're my favourite person. <laughs> <laughs> so, absolutely. Ice Cream Alex, famous film. Um, and guess what? In Alexandria, what do you do? You have an ice cold beer. <laughs> so, uh, we'd actually been in the desert for a couple of days. This beer was actually so welcome. Those smiles on our faces are absolutely genuine. And um, it was just fantastic to be in Alexandria in the Cecil Hotel where Montgomery stayed. So this is the Cecil Hotel, where we had that beer. Uh, it faces out to Alexandria Harbour. Um, and this was a place where uh, soldiers, where officers would stay on leave. And Montgomery definitely stayed there. Uh, in the Alexandria Bay, those who know your history, the uh, famous lighthouse on the bay would have been roughly there. Seventh wonder of the world. So, going back to Ice Colony Alex. We love Ice Colony Alex, don't we? 
Um, look at lovely Sylvia Sims there. And this is me with Sylvia a few years ago. I had the chance to meet her uh, and I discussed briefly the, ar the ardours of working in the desert and it was really, really good to meet her. Sadly, RIP Sylvia, she's died recently. Right, so starting to wind up now. What is living history? So I do this as a hobby, but I also show at uh, public displays. Uh, I sleep in a 1942 tent on a 1943 bed. And this is my son where, uh, reading a 1942 magazine. Uh, that is living history. And public come around, they chat to us, and we exchange stories. Uh, I have to say, occasionally, I might just use a modern sleeping bag. <laughs> this is my display. Uh, this is my display, obviously, the, the iconic LR main sign. Uh, all this kit fits in my people carrier. I am a genius at packing. Uh, but uh, this, this has actually won an award. My display here has won two awards at history shows. Uh, and it gives me great thrill to speak to the public. Uh, anybody with relations who recognise uh, the, the Jaboa logo, they come and speak to me and we exchange stories. And I, 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 that's what I really love about the living history element. So this is me and my son. Uh, on a, this is me's long range desert group. We have a Jeep. This is me playing with my Jeep uh, at shows. And I have other friends that have Jeeps as well. So, to wrap up, this is my father. I was very lucky when he, was, uh, he died in 2015, but in 2013, I was able to record his war memories. Uh, I've got roughly four hours of recorded tape. It's one of my most treasured items. Uh, here, you've got three generations. This is my father, this is my sister, this is my middle son, and this is my partner, Liz. And we're all there listening to his stories. He was very vocal. Um, um, I reference a song he kept singing, which was My Little Jippo Bint. Uh, what he says is, Anima scheme my fish for louche. Now, this is something that the soldiers said. When the soldiers were on leave, you had to learn, Anima scheme my fish for louche. Because what does it mean? It means, I am skint, I have no money. Because when you're on leave, you get pestered by these little, these little Arab boys saying, I have girl, I have clean girl, come with me, have fun, clean girl. Say, Anima scheme my fish for louche. And I didn't realise what it meant till after he died. It's tragic. I could have had a little joke with him, but no, no. There's this little story about my li little Jippo Bint, which is actually all about a prostitute. Anyway, going back to my father. So this is, uh, this is him on leave, uh, after he'd obviously just pushed away all the little uh, Arab boys, saying, I don't want anything to do with your, your nasty business. Uh, he's on the far left on a horse in front of the pyramids, and this is me there last October in the same place. Quite emotional, really nice to be there, properly connected with my father, uh, and you can appreciate all that they went through for wars. Thank you very much for uh, joining me uh, in my three hour talk that I condensed into just over an hour. Um, this is the end, or in other words, for you poor sods, the war waffle is now over. <laughs> this has been a Lone Rat presentation.